Okay, that is working. Okay. Um, good evening, everybody, and very warm welcome to everybody in the audience and those of you who are online, wherever you are. Um, my name is Eve Hal, and I'm on the advisory uh, board for the um, Public Policy Institute of WA. So very pleased to be here. Um, a welcome to our panel members. Um, they will be introduced more formally shortly. But first of all, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Wadjuk Noongar people whose traditional lands we're meeting on today and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. The theme for us tonight is about looking at what Australian life is going to look like for the rest of this decade and beyond, given we have a change of government. Um, some things will definitely change. Some will probably stay the same. If we reflect just on where we are today in Northbridge, this 200 years ago, it was a swampy place with freshwater lakes. People came here for a drink. The lakes had good fish in winter and turtles and lizards and frogs to eat in summer. And people would get together to talk about the strangeness of the season that year, whether there'd been more fires or not, whether the environment was changing. I'm sure this will all come up in our get together this evening. So many things change, some stay the same, but um, now of course there's much more ethnic variety, very different look to Australians, but we still come to Northbridge, it's still a place where we come to for a drink and a meal and a yarn. Um, a few words now about the University of Western Australia's Public Policy Institute. Firstly, I have to say it's, it's obviously run by some very visionary people because when they started planning this event, they must have known that there was going to be an extraordinary election result <laughs> so that we can have the sort of discussion we're going to have tonight. The, um, the, the uh, goal of, uh, of the Public, Public Policy Institute is to provide informed leadership by maximising the policy impact of the university's research, both in WA itself and in Australia as a whole and in the Indian Ocean region. It acts as a bridge between academia, government, and public and business needs. And it does this by running public events, just as this one is, organizing roundtable discussions, um, producing reports, providing UWA research expertise to policymakers and others, as well as training UWA researchers on how to work with government, business, and not-for-profits. Today's topic, dissecting Australian life after the election, obviously so topical, I can't wait myself to hear from the panel. We've clearly witnessed a seismic shift to the left, as well as the rise of the independents and the Greens. What, what is this new government going to do that will change our lives? We don't know yet, but one issue our new prime minister has already ad addressed in his victory um, speech, was to commit his party to the Uluru Statement from Uluru Statement from the Heart in full. And that of course um, includes a First Nations voice enshrined in our constitution. And I guess that will mean, well, it will mean a referendum. And we haven't had one of those for 23 years. When that will be, I guess we'll see. I hope that will lead us to becoming a better and more tolerant country towards our First Nations people. And I'm sure that will be part of the conversation this evening. Climate change and emission reduction targets, obviously another prime issue in this election. There's so much talk and so much of, around setting targets, which of course is the beginning, but we're going to have to do better and have an achievable plan to meet that target. In my opinion, that's going to need us to work more closely with the existing energy providers, but also to bring in more expertise into this country. That was done 40 to 50 years ago to build the oil and gas industry. Now we need people to dismantle that industry. And uh, to do that, we're gonna need a lot of technical professionals with a track record in solar and wind and hydrogen, biomass, and all those alternatives to fossil fuels. So we will need to be thinking hard about skilled migration again and get the quotas right. That's another issue that will impact our life for the rest of this decade and beyond. And with that, I'd like to hand over now to the director of the UWA Public Policy Institute, Shamit, to start the proceedings. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Eve. Um, 
I'm Shamit Sagar, as Eve just pointed out. I'm the director of the UWA Public Policy Institute. Uh, and you're very welcome to join us in this conversation this evening, dealing with dissecting the 2022 federal election. So the emphasis will be on dissecting. I don't know into how many pieces, but and they won't necessarily be neat and tidy, but um, we do need to shed some light on what is a, an unusual election, one that's not been comparable to anything that's taken place for at least a decade, maybe not longer. Um, but personally, can I just say also Kaya and Wanju, hello and welcome uh, to our event this evening. So we've got a big broad based uh, audience. Uh, we've got a number of people here. Uh, we've got several WA uh, departments represented both in the room as well as online. A number of MPs and councillors, although it, I gather it's also a parliamentary sitting day as well as an evening. Um, a number of sectors, large and small in business, uh, the legal sector, schools, universities, media, and so on. And beyond Perth, thanks to the wonder of that camera over there, um, we have people joining us from Kununara, uh, Kalgoorlie, Sydney, Newcastle, Melbourne, Canberra, Singapore, and Hong Kong, and so on and so forth. So it's good that you're with us and hopefully can take part in our discussion in a short while. Um, Eve very kindly um, put some flesh on the bones of what the election may have meant. And I think they're very much personal comments. Uh, I was is going to just sort of read out for you very briefly a list of what I think might be useful pegs for us to get into. They'll be entirely recognizable to you and they're in no particular order. Um, but the first is there appears to be some sort of reckoning between the Australian voting public uh, and their values and politics. And I'm thinking in particular of the ways in which uh, values and, and attitudes, not just opinions around climate and integrity, have sort of crept to the four of uh, the political discussion. Uh, there's quite a lot in that in terms of how we do politics and the nature of politics in the future. Uh, secondly, um, and related to that, there's something around who gets included in politics, the kind of composition. So I'm not the only one who's noticed that there's been a significant, if you want, feminization of Australian party politics, long overdue by international standards. And um, at the same time, there's been a bit of a breakthrough, to say the least, in terms of non-Anglo-Saxon Australians uh, taking their place uh, within party politics and within no period of time, no doubt, uh, in senior uh, cabinet and shadow cabinet um, places. Um, thirdly, um, just before the Labour Party gets carried away, and it shouldn't, uh, there's a missing one third of voters. Uh, Labour's share of the vote, despite a compulsory voting system, is slightly down where it was in 2019, and yet it's formed almost a government, we'll wait, wait and see. But there clearly seems to be a decline of the kind of two-party duopoly that parties got used to over many decades. And so these independently minded voters are going to go from different places, uh, uh, the parties they've got now or, 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 the, or the candidates they've got now, It'll be useful to see where they'll go in the future. Fourthly, in no particular order, there's this question of leadership. Uh, Dave Sharma, uh, one Liberal MP who lost his seat uh, at the weekend as a result of the Teal uh, uh, independent sort of rebellion, if you want, uh, went on to describe in this morning's newspaper that in his words, not mine, there was almost a visceral dislike of his boss, Scott Morrison. A visceral dislike when he was knocking on doors. Make of that what you will. Uh, fifthly and penultimately, uh, there's plenty to talk around, about him in relation to foreign policy and security. There was a bit of talk about the election having a kind of khaki feel to it early on, certainly some efforts to break up bipartisanship around foreign policy questions. And of course, we've had the new uh, prime minister just come back from a very important meeting, uh, his first meeting with the Quad. And sixthly, and if not to be forgotten, there's the suggestion, I think it should be taken seriously, we're meeting here in Perth after all, uh, that it was WA that won it. Um, after many, many years, it seems to be that um, the uh, kingmaker is uh, the people of WA out West. Uh, an 11% two party preference swing in favor of Labour, more than three times more uh, greater than what you saw over East. Clearly the people of this state uh, are behaving out of line with their Australian counterparts. And if I can just quote my colleague, John Fillimore at Curtin University, who wrote over the weekend, and I'm quoting, with federal Labour owing so much to WA, satisfying the ambitions and expectations of his WA MPs and the broader WA community will be an early challenge for Prime Minister Albanese. We'll make of that what you will. Anyhow, 
to shed light on all of that, we're in the great company of a distinguished panel. Uh, and I'm just going to um, casually move over there and introduce them if I can. Assuming my mic. Yes? Okay. Um, so we have uh, on the panel in front of us, to my far left and right as you look at him, uh, the Honorable Colin Barnett. You may recognize him as a former Premier of WA um, as recently as 2017, uh, first assumed the role in 2008. Uh, and amongst other things, Colin spends his time uh, uh, as A in a junk professor in the business school at UWA, and also uh, very graciously is a member of the advisory board of our own institute. Uh, sat on my far right, uh, left as you see here, there's, there's some, some sort of meaning about the left and right here going on. Um, uh, we have uh, the Honorable Professor Carmen Lawrence. Uh, Carmen is also a former premier here in WA, having uh, taken the sort of uh, hot seat back in the early 90s. Uh, and she is also an emeritus professor in the School of Psychological Science. And she also sits on the UWA PPI board. And we're very grateful to have her here. On my immediate right here is Dr. Sue Boyd. Uh, Sue is an immediate past president of the Australian Institute of International Affairs here in WA. Uh, she's been very active in that uh, space uh, of late. Uh, she's also, um, and I just need to get this right, the former head of the diplomatic service in the Australian Foreign Service. She has a three and a half decade record uh, dealing with the nitty gritty of Australia's relations uh, with countries far and near. And, and just to give a shout out, she also has a book that came out a little while ago called Not Always Diplomatic. I recommend it to you. And last but not least, and I just should declare an interest because all the panel members plus the uh, the chair of a combined age of 575 <laughs> years. We decided to pick someone who might vaguely look like they may be, I'm not sure how old Martina is, but much younger than the rest of us. So thank you, Martina. Um, Martina Oknanova um, is a co-founder with Jess Smith of an organization known as She Runs. You probably have come across it, but if you haven't, I recommend you take a good look at it. She Runs, no hyphen in that. And it's a campaign and training organization that's committed to identifying and boosting the political careers of young female candidates. They've got a lot to work, work to do. And I think some of the, the things we've been seeing of late is in part down to the efforts they've been putting in over the years. And her day job, she is a professional communications and advocacy consultant. So we're in their hands. Uh, the format we've got this, after, this evening is that we're gonna spend about 45 minutes with the panel um, getting sort of the issues off their chest as it were. Uh, and then we've got about 25 minutes of Q&A. So please sort of feel free to store up your questions, catch my eye. And for those who are tuning in online, please use the Q&A function on Zoom. We have Rebecca, my colleague, who will be sort of faithfully representing those questions uh, a bit later on. Um, so let's move on. I'm gonna ask the panel one question uh, just to get the, uh, the ball rolling. And it is kind of a two, two and a half minute version of their immediate reaction to the election outcome over the weekend and what they think they, it means for people gathered this evening here. I'm going to look to Carmen first. Thank you. Um, and good evening, everyone. And I'd like to pay my respects to, to the Wajak Noongar people on whose land we're meeting. Look, what we saw on Saturday was a clear repudiation of business as usual. I think however you construe it, politics in Australia won't be the same for a very long time. Nearly 40% of the primary vote was effectively directed away from the major parties. There were variations, obviously, from state to state and seat to seat. But that's a very significant change in Australia's politics. Some have described it, including myself, uh, reaching for geography as a tectonic geology, a tectonic shift. Maybe, maybe not, but certainly people's kitchen chairs have been shaken pretty fiercely. Um, I think we've seen a move away from a monolithic us versus them, two party, red and blue kind of politics in this country. It's been happening for some time, but, time, but this has really uh, put the flag uh, up where it belongs. There's been a clear message too from uh, various um, parts of the electorate. Don't take us for fools, respect us, particularly true here in Western Australia in Fowler with Keneally being transported there against the community's wishes. There are various forms of that don't take us for fool's message, but it's very clear. Pay attention to your community and not by pork barrelling. Don't insult us by showering us with money. Listen to us is a message that's come through loud and clear, I think, to the major parties. 
and voters have shown themselves willing to overturn the status quo with huge swings, as we saw in the teal sweet seats. We're not talking about two or three percent, we're talking about 13, 14, 15 percent. And here in Western Australia, very significant as well. The government wasn't listening to us, many people said, and that's why we did what we did. And that I think is a very important lesson for the incoming government. If they don't heed it, they will suffer the same fate in my view. What I saw coming out of this was a sentiment of hope and some relief. I don't think people have signed up entirely to the, to the Labor brand as the government, but they're willing to give them a chance. They're willing to see what happens and they are generally hopeful that there'll be a change uh, in the way business is conducted, political business is conducted in this country. People have been begging for some time for an end to the mindless culture wars, whether it's about climate change or diversity in our community. Stop, enough, don't do it anymore, I think is another clear message that comes from this. And we talked about a visceral, visceral repudiation of Morrison's way of doing politics. I heard that very often from many people. No more dishonesty, no more opportunistic stoking of fears and anger. Let's move toward a much more civilised way of conducting business. I've been in politics long enough to know that that hope may be dashed, but I think with that big group of independents, the, the government and the Liberal Party will have to listen and listen hard, or they will end up on the, the rubbish heap of history. Thank you. Cheers. Sue. Well, my background is in international relations. And so naturally, I was thrilled at what's coming out on the international relations front. You remember when President Biden was elected in the States, he said, democracy is back. And that was just a terrific thing to hear from the President of the United States, because democracy is actually how you get things done in a way that's going to, is going to satisfy the needs of everybody who's concerned and that'll, that'll, that'll stick. Um, I was delighted to, to hear that uh, the, the focus is going to be on uh, climate change and, um, and uh, uh, problems with the environment, because when we look at our relations with the Pacific, and there's also an emphasis on doing better in our relations with the Pacific, which I could, could say a lot about, the main thing is what they're most concerned about is climate change. And it was very noticeable that one of the early messages of congratulation that came um, to Albanese was from Bani Marama, who is president of Fiji. And uh, they, the, his first utterance was, we're so glad you're going to do something about climate change. I was, I was high commissioner in Fiji for a time and also accredited to Tuvalu and Nauru. And while I was there, John Howard imposed uh, the Pacific solution to deal with uh, refugees that uh, wanted to come to Australia to have their refugee status tested, but were not going to be allowed to uh, put foot on Australian soil. And we were looking desperately um, under direction of the government for Pacific islands where we could set up somewhere where these, uh, these aspirants could be processed. So it was my job as I was accredited to Fiji and Tuvalu and Nauru to actually go and ask the prime ministers of those countries if they would partner with Australia in this venture. Fiji was quite clever, because Fiji is very clever, and uh, it said, well, this is a very important matter, um, High Commissioner, and uh, obviously we'll have to refer it to Parliament. And Parliament will have to tell, say what they think about this. I'm afraid I can't give you an instant answer. And Parliament said, well, we'll have to set up a special committee to look at this. So I'm afraid, High Commissioner, this will take a bit of time before we can give you an answer. They clearly didn't want to go anywhere near it. The, um, uh, the uh, Prime Minister of Tuvalu was even more straightforward. He said, You've got to be fucking joking, Sue. <laughs> this was on the telephone. I had to telephone, it wasn't face to face. He said, you know that climate change is really important for us. You know, Funafuti, the major atoll, is only 1.5 meters above sea level. We're seeing sea level rise. It's affecting us. It's pushing us off our island. We've been saying to you, this is an issue and we want you to help us. And we've been, and we've said to you, if we get pushed off our islands, we'll, you know, can you give us special migration status to Australia? Will you, will, you, will you take us on board? 
And the Australian government said, no, 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 don't be so silly. This climate change is a lot of nonsense. You know, we only know this is a, a cyclical business. It will be back to normal in a few years. So don't get your knickers in a knot. And as for coming to Australia, I'm sorry, we can't give you special migrant status. But you know, really, if you're in problem, if in trouble, Australia will always help you. So you'll all be, always be welcome. But no, we're not going to give you any any status. So with this background, the, the Tuvalu said, why should we? We take your people. You know, we've got a small, we've got a small population. Our land is very small already. We're hard for us to manage. And you want to take more people? Get fucked, Sue. <laughs> so that was the message that I transmitted to my government um, in so many words. Uh, and uh, and uh, Nelly Sopwanga, who was the president then, is president again now, was another of those who sent an early message to the prime minister, new prime minister, uh, with congratulations on what's on what's gone on. The, the only um, place we had with success was finding somewhere was, of course, Nauru. And we all know the history of Nauru. What people don't know, really, is why Nauru agreed, agreed to take uh, the asylum seekers so into partners. Yep. So, so my story, I'll do it uh, briefly. Briefly, uh, briefly. Go okay. Yeah. Basically, um, we bribed them. Basically, they had a lot of uh, money they needed. They didn't have any money. They hadn't paid their public servants. They hadn't paid their bills. They needed money desperately to survive. Will Australia pay for all these deficits that we have? Yes, of course we will. Thank you very much for helping us. I've got a lot more things to say. We'll, we'll come back. We'll come back. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. That's an ongoing story. Yeah. Martina, your immediate reaction. My immediate reaction from the outcome of the federal election was that representation matters. Um, over the past two years, I have worked very closely through our organization, She Runs, with women who are interested in changing their societies and their communities, but didn't see themselves represented. We had women who were incredible leaders in their communities, but had absolutely no idea how they were able to get involved with politics, because a lot of the times they didn't see many young people, they didn't see many people from migrant backgrounds, let alone refugees. They didn't see many young women who didn't have parents who were in politics entering politics. And that was sort of something that was really discouraging because they didn't actually know what was happening once you enter politics. So the first immediate reaction I had to the outcome was that representation really does matter. When we look at the current composition of the Australian Parliament and Senate, oh boy, it is so exciting and the numbers keep on growing. I mean, we went from a 31% of female representation to 38%. And in the Senate, we currently have 52% of female representatives, which is absolutely fantastic. After I got over this initial excitement of, of seeming progress, I also realized that this is an incredible first step forward um, and started thinking, oh boy, we have so much more work to do. Um, so representation matters and also we need to do a little bit more work to make sure that we keep up because in the next three years it's going to be absolutely crucial that we ensure that there's seeming representation is going to trickle down to individual communities and every single one of the candidates especially female candidates who didn't see themselves represented and now they do will actually understand what is their path towards the change that they want to see in their communities thank you uh, Colin, immediate reactions, two minutes. Uh, well, when I was Premier, I used to be often called uh, the Emperor, but I'm feeling a bit like the last Emperor at the moment. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, uh, and congratulations to Anthony Albanese and the Labor Party. Um, I think we're going to see for the next decade Labor governments, both federally and at a state level. So it's a unique alliance in, in that sense. Um, the themes through the election, as I observed it, um, were lot of climate change, very prominent, uh, issues to do with women, or if I can express it that way, and cost of living. I think they were the sort of three themes that I could see continually coming up on, on commentary. Uh, however, in terms of specific policies, uh, this has probably been the weakest election I've ever seen on both sides of politics. Uh, very little specifics about how we're going to do things. Um, that concerns me quite a bit. I think in politics too, um, uh, a leader of a party, whichever one it might be, but um, let's just, I'll just say Liberal and Labor for the moment, uh, you have real authority and power, if you like, if you actually not only win an election, but you win an election which takes government off the opponents and to you. And so Al Anthony Albanese has got a unique time now. I don't think he's a particularly inspiring person, a good guy, know him, not that well, but he's now got a unique opportunity 
over the next six months, because it doesn't last long, where he will have almost uh, an absolute ability to do things. Um, the two things I think he should do this week, uh, immediately start uh, a process to have four year fixed terms. People hated this election. Uh, it's a simple thing and it'll probably be a couple of elections out uh, and get rid of a so-called national cabinet and get back to a sensible structure of government. Uh, it's a cabinet without a parliament and uh, you, you, know, you can't have two cabinets running the, the aspects of the country. And I'd hope that we'd also see over time, um, I think one of the most inefficient and wasteful and confusing aspects of Australian politics is the overlap and duplication between state and, gov and federal government. And, and I'm not talking about constitutional issues. It, is, it has been quite shameful, I think, in recent years. Uh, and this election was really about matters that primarily, while well, local issues are important, but have been at a local level. And I know one commentator, I think, from the East Coast described it as an election to see who would be mayor of Australia. And it was a bit like that. So um, while there's celebration now for Labor, and I think that's good, um, a lot of things to come. For the Liberal Party, I think they're in a desperate situation. Um, time is a big factor in politics. They've been in power for nine years. Uh, and so there's always going to be a, an opportunity or a mood for change. Uh, and that will happen to Labor in, in due course, but it's probably a decade away. Uh, the other aspect that I think was overlooked in this election was from a Liberal Party perspective, uh, they lost the top half for their batting order. In the last five or six years, with the like or dislike individuals, uh, Tony Abbott, Malcolm Turnbull, Julie Bishop, Christian Porter, uh, Chris Pine, um, and, and it, there's others. It just goes on. They lost all of their experienced and competent people who could debate in Parliament, who could manage a department and so on. So, you know, that's the way the cycle goes. So um, I'm glad I'm not involved. <laughs> <laughs> there was a time this time last year, I think, just after the state elections, you were the last man standing. You used to make a joke about that, yeah? Yeah. And it feels that way. <laughs> so I've got, I've got to, I want to ask um, this kind of a Carmen and Colin question to begin with, which is... Um, you're both from parties that are actually um, over a period of time doing less well in terms of attracting the loyalty of supporters. There may be different groups of people voting for them, not the same group of people. But the long term trend is that the Australian public have found and if you want, increasingly falling in love with independent options. We saw one particular one at this election, but many others. How, how do you react to that with without your party hats on, in, in a sense? Carmen. Well, I think it's I think it's important to recognise that the people who, particularly the teal independents, who have you know been so prominent in this election, they were speaking very specifically about a certain type of community organisation, a bottom-up kind of politics, a democratic approach to selecting candidates, deciding on policies, and if you think about it, that's the way the major parties used to be. They used to have broad membership. They used to invite their members to take part in policy discussions. Their members were involved in selecting candidates. These were people embedded in their communities. They were very active in all the organisations that go to make up a single community. And I mean, I've spoken about this many times before. What's happened to, to the Labor Party in particular, but Colin can speak to the Liberals, is that they've essentially become corporations who manage elections. And a few people are in control of choosing candidates. And we've, we saw candidates parachuted in uh, to poor effect. Uh, and very few people are involved in the day-to-day running of the policies and programs that make up our body politic and a de democracy. So I think one of the things that's going to have to happen uh, if there's to be any shift away from the, what we've seen in the last, uh, uh, the last election is that the major parties rediscover internal democracy at the very least. And they also discover the need to relate um, in, a, in a very systematic way to their communities so that they're seen to be democratic in the parliament, listening to the independents, giving them opportunities to debate and so on. It may sound a little idealistic, but I think what the election has shown us is that people do want a different kind of politics. They want bottom up, not top down politics in Australia. Uh, can I just press you on that? So mm -hmm. if you're going to write a memo to Prime Minister Albanese for him to read tomorrow morning mm -hmm. and say the title of the memo is, here is two things you could do following up what you just said a moment ago, what would be on that list? Well, one would be that, you know, maybe not him, but but one of the other people with some time on their hands <laughs> would get involved in, in party reform. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think the trends we're talking about are going to change without that. And maybe some people think that's a good thing. The parties just disappear ultimately, but I suspect there's an important role for them to play. So the first thing is, you know, give someone the task of doing that. And the second thing is to listen very closely to what that 40%, nearly 40% of the population were saying 
and and even while you're setting up your ministry and the parliamentary procedures that you pay attention to what it is that they were saying, and you ensure that they're properly incorporated into parliaments and processes in policy making, that you don't simply say, we won, go away, that that would be a serious mistake. So establishing almost not, not in the way of a formal uh, relationship as the coalition have, but establishing the processes that ensure that all of those voices, including the backbenchers, of the Labor Party and the opposition have an opportunity to properly represent their constituencies. Thanks, thank you. And so, so Colin, the, the corollary of that question would be the same. So Mr. Dutton or someone else will lead the party that you're, that you're a member of. Um, I mean, uh, Carmen's talking about doing politics different from within the parties. Is there a liberal equivalent of that? Well, I agree with what Carmen said, but I'll just add something to reflect on. If you look back, say, to Federation 120 years ago, um, Australia at a national level, federal level, and at all states and territories has been governed by either a Labor government or a Liberal government. And if you look at that period of history, Australia's had good government. It's been one of two exceptions along the way. I'm not saying it's been perfect, but we have had stable, good government. Now that's changing. I mean, you've got an educated, more independently thinking population. Um, for the Labor Party, at least it has its origins uh, with the union movement, union membership is significantly down and probably continues to fall, but it does have a structure. The Liberal Party doesn't really have a structure. And uh, that really struck me on polling day. Um, I stood on the polling booth at 2J, which is a bit of an escape for me, uh, um, and uh, handing out as you do, you know. So I was there all, all morning. And as pe people came in to vote, and I was saying, you know, you know please support the Liberal Party, um, everyone was very courteous but they basically walked past me most people and I realized within 10 minutes that um, the Liberal Party was actually on the nose uh, so I changed it and it's Melissa Price is the member there so I changed to simply say please support Melissa and people took the how to vote and whether they vote I think that many of them voted and it was quite clear to me that people in the in the result uh, for the Liberal Party perspective people weren't voting against the sitting members they were voting against the Liberal Party uh, it had lost the confidence of the public. Uh, and I think that, also, that came from probably two sources. One, uh, it's always little things in politics that bring people down. Uh, you, know, um, quite a, you know, when Bromham Bishop got a helicopter from Melbourne to Geelong, when Tony Abbott gave Prince Philip a knighthood, uh, when Matt Burney described the, the um, ask quit, made comments about the uh, Pope's partner, you know, <laughs> really stupid stuff like that, that brings you down. And I think Morrison's comments about West Australian being cave dwellers, uh, members here of the Liberal Party, senators and state members uh, were supporting um, opening the borders when it was clearly unpopular in Western Australia. Um, and their job is to, you know, you'd hope it's the case that federal members of parliament, both House of Reps and senators, you know, they, they stand to represent Western Australia. But what we saw happening you know, a year or so ago was those federal members were actually representing Canberra in Western Australia. They weren't doing the job and people saw straight through that. So I think that's why Western Australia got such a, or the Liberal Party got such a poor result here was those local factors coming in. But um, yeah, we're gonna have a more complicated uh, parliamentary system and uh, it's, it's gonna be difficult, but I, I just remind you, you actually, we've had good government in Australia compared to, and even a, a big change of government that has took place uh, no violence that I could hear or see of. People were courteous and respectful. Um, not many countries have that. Martina, mm. do you think that will do the trick? Or do you think politics has to be done radically differently for the two parties to survive? I think it's a little bit of both. I think we definitely require change to the way um, individual parties operate and how they represent the communities that they um, um, are trying to represent in, in, in Canberra or within state parliaments um, um, here. Um, I think that there needs to be sort of small incremental changes within the political parties themselves, but also on a national level. I think within the political parties themselves, um, from a female representation, we need to sort of look at what seat um, women usually get put into. Those are the marginalised seats, not the safe seats. Um, we need to look at um, the parachuting of the candidates that, that Carmen already mentioned and sort of see what that does to the trust that the parties have with the individual communities. 
we need to look into whether the parties are listening to the um, constituents within their communities, which seem not to happen. And on a sort of a national level, and that's been already mentioned before, was there needs to be a greater trust um, of uh, the society in the work that the parliamentarians are doing for them. And also a greater understanding in terms of what they actually do for us on a local state and federal level um, as well. And lastly, again, Carmen already mentioned that, there needs to be sort of greater decency when it comes to uh, bipartisanship or multipartisanship and how the political parties operate together. I think after years of um, pandemic, um, climate change induced floods and, and fires, um, the last thing that people need right now is the parties bickering between each other. Um, so the decency and, and um, politeness is sort of something that people are really craving at the moment as well. So there's a couple of different shifts that need to happen on party and for a societal level. Okay. And I just want to just can, press... Can I just, can I just say one, one point point comment first? Uh, if you follow the media, and I suppose we all do, um, and the discussion, there is a broad view in the community that these political parties are powerful, big organisations. They are not. I won't speak for the Labor Party, no, maybe no, no. Carmen can add. But the Liberal Party is nothing like that. It is uh, it is not as strong as it used to be by a big margin. It's made up of volunteers. It's got all sorts of odd people there. It is not a powerful organisation at all. I can assure you of that. Nine years I was Premier, I never got from the Liberal Party a sensible policy idea, not one. You know, they're, they're not what the, the way they're portrayed in the media. Okay. But notwithstanding that, I was going to ask Martina a, a related question, which is, just for the benefit of the audience. Now you run a training program. Mm -hmm. You've got relatively young female aspirant candidates in front of you. Do they sense that the parties that they perhaps would end up having careers with, that there is some sort of toxic nature of, of getting involved in, in? I mean, Carmen talked about these as being corporates that it you know lost touch with, with the grassroots and democracy. Do you get a sense of that in the programs that you run? I think a lot of the times is not having an understanding of what the political parties do and what they can do for the candidates themselves um, and not necessarily having an understanding of how the political party itself can help someone propel and whether it would be easier for someone to run as an independent. Um, so I think that there is a um, lack of awareness of uh, the work the political parties do and then lack of understanding of the support that the political parties can provide to the candidates. So we bring the political parties in and once they explain it, uh, a lot of the candidates um, have a greater awareness about what actually goes into the work that the political parties are doing for the candidates themselves. Okay, so Sue, when, when our friends and our enemies near and far look at us here in Australia, how do they respond to Australia's political class, the people who've been running this country from both parties for the last 20 years? I think basically we're respected um, from overseas. I think um, people who are involved in, in government and the impact of government um, recognise that Australians are sensible people. We're middle of the road people. Um, we occupy a sort of particular place, a level, uh, international relations. Um, we're obviously not a superpower, um, but we're also not a poor nation. Um, we're a, a competent middle power, and one that's actually a useful ally to have as you're trying to advance things. I mean, we've played that role consistently, and well, that's the way we're seen, I think, internationally. I mean, we're well respected by, we're, we're well, well respected by us, uh, the, the senior people uh, like Biden, like uh, the Prime Minister of, of, of the UK. We're, we're well regarded by those people. I obviously see the way that, um, that our new Prime Minister was, was uh, received in Tokyo. And I have to tell you, just it's a bit, it's a bit of a dig really, you know, the way you dress and the way you appear in public matters. And I thought, you know, that the, the fact that um, Albanese has had this fantastic makeover, which I think really helped him in, pro in projecting himself as a fellow that we could identify with and be proud of to have as our prime minister. And I was especially proud when he got to when he got to Tokyo and there was the lineup of the four leaders of the quad and they were all impeccably dressed in fantastic suits or all, all navy blue that seems to be the power color at the moment, but uh, impeccable. And Albanese was there in a suit which is as smart as the other ones had. <laughs> I felt very proud if I could say that that way. So, I, I have some
absolutely agree with you. <laughs> and let's hope we never have another election in Australia where the two leading candidates are ScoMo and Albo. Yeah. Yeah. Let's get rid of that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, but um, go on, briefly, go on, go on. Just a, a very yeah. quick point about someone raised the question of trust. And one of the things that I think has been slowly declining in Australia is trust in the political parties, but more importantly, that's been rubbing off uh, onto trust or lack of it in our democratic institutions. But having said that, Australia still sits really near the top of the tree, so we, we, we should hang on to that. Some of the work that's been done, for instance, on responses to, to COVID and rates of vaccination show that those countries where trust in institutions is high tend to be the ones who've managed things like the death rate best. And we're still well placed on that. So it's something to retain and to aim to keep. And so trust in our public institutions and our political parties is not just something that's nice to have if you can get it. It is actually a very critical part of the way we conduct business in this country. Yeah. And it's been earned, you're saying? Yes, it has to it's be earned. earned. It yeah. has to be earned, absolutely. Okay, yeah. Yeah. so someone said in the first round of questions, I can't remember who it was, but the words the effect of um, opportunities to be stoking up fear. Who, who said, said that? You said that, yeah, I, I couldn't remember. Um, and I just want to talk a little bit about um, leadership right now. Um, and it's been an unusual parliament, an unusual 10 years in which climate wars and sort of, you know, divisions have been there. So I just want to get a sense of whether or not you think that's sort of stuck in Australian politics. It's contributed to a sense that, you know, mud when it's slung also sticks and it get, turns people off politics. So with your permission, I'm going to use something I shouldn't normally do, which is use a prop. And it might sort of remind some of you um, about where we're going to go with this. Um, <laughs> I could stand up with a, I could stand up with a broad accent and say, "Go on, touch it," uh, but you wouldn't believe my accent. Um, but but this is a prop, and it's designed to bring out sort of fear more than anything else. Uh, you can have a view about whether it's effective or not. You can have a view whether or not we should be powering our, our homes and our cities uh, using thermal coal. But it's a prop that's part of our political culture. It was it was a part of political theatre in Parliament not so long ago. So do you think that, that or something like that has a role in, in supporting our democracy and supporting public attitudes in our democracy? Carmen, to start with, then to Colin. I wrote a book called Fear in Politics <laughs> a while ago. Um, you can hold so it. I understand the role that fear plays in changing people's minds and votes. And sometimes it's a reasonably based fear. I mean, it, we needed to be afraid of the virus and the pandemic. We needed to have that motivation to assist us in embracing the change that was required. It's when it's used cynically in order to uh, press certain buttons that people would probably rather not have pressed around things like race, for example, around things like safety in their own homes, so the law and order debates, attitudes toward minority groups, uh, refugees and asylum seekers, Sue's already mentioned. When those buttons are pressed hard, uh, that's in my view, always a sign of a cynical attempt to get a response that's not based on a careful assessment of the policy, but on a straight emotional response. Emotional responses are not bad. I'm, as a, you know, someone who studied psychology, I understand the role they play both in our lives and in our, our citizenry, but when they're exploited in that way and the, the, the climate change um, can be exploited both ways. I mean, climate change risks are real um, and the risk from failing to act is certain because it's ha happening now. But on the other hand, and I think this is what Alwan Easy has done at least so far successfully, there is a positive side to that. If we act, then there are certain benefits that accrue. And if we take the right decision in relation to the pandemic, then we can, you know, as a society, save our older people from a premature death and so on. With climate change, we can reduce the likelihood of our neighbours going under um, of, you know, floods and, and fires uh, engulfing us. So I think, you know, fear has a role but it is also a poisonous addition when it's clearly in the service of a cynical objective. Colin, fear, does, does it have a role? Uh, no, I, I, I think it's very difficult um, sometimes for premiers and prime ministers and ministers. Um, community does look to government to protect them and look after them. And I've made mistakes, no doubt about that. I'm sure I don't, you probably haven't, Carmen. <laughs> yeah, I'll sign up to that. Uh, we sometimes say something that's the wrong message. Um, and um, the other aspect I'd make too is that um, in, in government, you have to make decisions. And it's a fine line before being listening to the community and caring and consulting and then finally getting to a position. Um, 
and arrogance. You'll be accused of arrogance. But people generally don't want to make the hard decisions and they will look to elected representatives to make them. So I guess one of the, the skills in politics is to try and know, um, I used to always say to new members on issues, think about the issue, think about what's right, and then think about whether you can achieve it politically, do it in that order, not the other way around. Uh, and I think that's pretty good advice. Um, sharman has got a bit of coal there. Um, I'm not afraid of coal, but, <laughs> uh, uh, and just sort of touching back to the sort of the climate issue, which I think has been a strange debate, but um, in it, I was energy minister in Western Australia in the nineties for basically nine years. And uh, you might remember there was a, a strange weather event where a big mist came across Perth. Uh, some of you might remember that. And uh, the whole power system collapsed. And, uh, you know, people had all sorts of views about renewables and everything else. But when the power system collapsed, um, Howard Sattler used to be on the radio, um, told, put, gave, put on the radio my phone number, my office phone number, and the switchboard in those days just absolutely, absolutely melted down. And uh, but there was only one bright moment in that. It was just a consuming issue. Uh, when people lost their power supply, they didn't give a toss about climate change or renewables, um, switch immediately. And that's the issue that will come up, I think, because of the lack of policy. But the only thing that gave me some pleasure that day was um, someone rang, one of the thousands of people that rang in, said, I want to speak to that asshole." And uh, the receptionist uh, had the presence of mind, which particular asshole are you referring to? <laughs> <laughs> so, so Must have more than one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Brief, br briefly, um, trust. I mean, what's your observation about how you build trust uh, and, and, and sto stoking fear? Do you think that's part and parcel of our culture now? I think um, judging it by the result of the election on the weekend, um, the people have spoken that they no longer want to have uh, parliamentarians and those who represent them that stoke fear and that create um, this... <laughs> you know, um, fear of everything amongst, uh, amongst the society. Um, I mean, the gender version of the call was when the prime minister said that women should be happy that they were met with bullets when they were peacefully protesting um, to ensure that their workplaces were safe uh, following the um, allegations uh, of rape in the halls of the parliament house. I mean, for someone who is a female to hear that, um, that can only stoke one emotion, and that is outrage. Um, and we saw that outrage over the weekend. So I think that um, we definitely heard a loud no to the culture and, and to that sort of, I would say the, the culture of fear and the culture of public relations that, that speaks to only to a selected few groups of, of voters, because even those groups said no on the weekend and it didn't work really well for them. Okay, Sue? So Yes, I just think that I think that the big fear issue in the international environment moment is the question of obviously of China, and uh, many members of the Australian population are particularly directly impacted by uh, trade embargoes and blockages of supply and so on and so forth. So it's, it translates into real real money um, for us and, and costs to our to our companies. And I think one of the terrific things that's happened in this election is the the um, uh, a message of congratulation that came from the Chinese Premier very early in the piece and offering discussion, offering to open the door because the door has been so closed. And I have to say, I also have to, 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 to criticize the, the government that's now gone, but I think they mishandled that disgustingly. You know, they didn't open doors, they didn't find ways to talk to people. They, they sort of megaphone diplomacy stood up and said, well, if the, if the minister won't call me back, well, what can we do? You know, well, why would the minister call him back? What was, what was going to be the outcome of a discussion like that? They have to, have to prepare the ground for it. So I think now we have a real opportunity here to do something practical about the, about the, the challenge, from, challenge from China. And I just hope that the government, new government manages it well. And I'm a bit worried about... Um, the, uh, the comments this morning about uh, China and its impact on us. 
I think you need to discipline your, your cabinet very well. You need to discipline the members of your party well so they don't go off at the wrong tangents, that they don't shut off discussion. If your doors are now open, what we've got to do is work quietly and deliberately and intelligently to use those open doors and try and, uh, try and alleviate the fear, if you like. So I think it, it's, it's, a, it's a, a, a strategic issue. Um, if the question of Taiwan comes up, the question of one China comes up, you know, China's wish to be recognized as the pre predominant major power in our region is clearly part of it. We need to manage that, but you can only manage it if you've got communication and the door is now open and we need to use that properly. Just as a footnote to that, well, I mean, well. I agree it needs a degree of subtlety and I think you'll find that I'd be surprised if the uh, Albanese government doesn't dial down the, 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 if you like, the tenor of that rhetoric. They will still stand up for human rights and values of that kind. You won't find them um, removing that from their conversations with China. But uh, someone did an analysis of the seats in Sydney that changed hands to Labor or to independence, but mainly to Labor, and showed that in those seats where you had significant numbers or the booths, significant numbers of Australian Chinese, Chinese Australians, I should say, the vote was really, it was a big swing, 14, 15%. So th th those people were, were um, affected by the fallout from that kind of fear mongering. They're the ones who copped it uh, in their neighbourhoods and they were really unhappy and expressed that in their vote. With the um, outbreak of COVID going back you know, a couple of years, one word, when Maurice, Maurice Plain, probably at the instructions of others, mm. um, made the comment that we need an independent inquiry, mm. that immediately offended the communist government in mm. power and offended all Chinese people mm. and offended me because what's probably not, what I don't think is recognised on the East Coast is the relationship with China is predominantly with Western Australia and has been historically. Um, at one stage, during a sort of a boom period around 2012, Western Australia's exports to China were equal to half of the total USA exports to China. That's how important we were, very much focused on this state. And uh, it's caused a lot of angst in the business community throughout Western Australia. So yeah, a bit more subtlety, a bit more courtesy. Okay. But we, that's gonna come up because at the same time you need to have a single foreign policy. So that will come up in discussion. I need to move on because time, time is gonna go by. Um, a little bit about domestic issues. We talk quite a lot about climate. Um, talk a bit about, about the economy. I want to bring up this point about um, integrity and the Integrity Commission, just to get your reactions to this. I mean, first of all, I want to know, do you think that voters were actually voting on the proposition of having an Integrity Commission? It seems kind of a distant thing that's to do with how people do politics. And second of all, what do you, you know, what, what's the need for an integrity commission right now? How bad is the rot in Australian politics such that we now need that and there's a commitment to have that? Carmen first. I mean, I think one of the fantasies has always been, um, and the Labour Party um, propagated it for some time as well, but it now seems to reside in the Liberal Party, is that you don't ever have corruption at a national level. It only happens at state level. And clearly that isn't the case. And there are various forms of corruption. You know, there's the obvious brown paper bag kind of corruption where money changes hands for favours. But there's also the kind of corruption that we've seen with the administration of grants, for example, where certain groups are favoured without proper evidence of need uh, and it buys votes. You know, that's a different kind of corruption and one that certainly I think needs examination. So some of it may not fit all within the sim simple uh, integrity commission of the kind that's been proposed by the Teals and by Labor, but it will focus attention on how government make, makes decisions about the distribution of the benefits and the costs of governing. And I think that's what Australians have been asking for, whether they were Teal Independents or Greens or people swinging to Labor here in Western Australia and, and other seats. Show us what you're doing and justify what you're doing, justify the expenditure you're making and um, hold, we will hold you to account and we want the parliament to play a role in that as well. So I, I do think there's been a focus on it, maybe not in every case, ticking a particular kind of investigative body, but generally speaking, a desire to be more part of politics, but also to see it the way it's done, that it's not some kind of sausage being manufactured in the back room. Yeah. Okay. Colin, so the party leader that's outgoing did actually give an interview in the middle of the campaign saying he thought it was quite wrong that public servants made decisions ultimately and politicians should be making these decisions about disbursement of public funds. It caused a few eyebrows to be raised. Did, how do you react to that? Well, first, can I just say, um, following on from Carmen, um, in this state, we've got a corruption and crime commission. Uh, I think it should be called just an integrity commission 
we investigate expenditure through departments and ex expenditure by members of parliament and, and ministers. Uh, and the, I think the classic example is Gladys Berejiklian in New South Wales. Mm. I'm, not, I'm not defending Gladys, I don't even know her, but um, she, she mucked up an issue, did, did handle it badly, but it was basically a show trial televised. Uh, most people out there in the community probably thought she was a criminal. Uh, it was portrayed as though it was a criminal event. It wasn't. And I think it's, you know, I think we've all seen people's careers destroyed over yeah, something that's improper, should have handled better. Um, so if it's criminal, give it to the police and, and make that distinction between what's an inquiry into something about propriety of conduct and so on, uh, or perhaps, uh, uh, and distinguish that from police things. So uh, what was the point you made? You actually asked me? <laughs> Do you think Morrison was right by saying these decisions should be made by politicians? Uh, yeah, look, I think... What, I, public money, probably, disbursement of public money. Yeah, absolutely. You go to an election and you promise something, if you don't deliver it, you're accused of, you know, failing to do so. So, I mean, we elect people to make decisions. And one of my favourite beefs, and I won't get on my soapbox about it, too much decision-making has been de delegated to so-called regulators. And if you want to look at problems in Australian politics uh, and Australian government, look at them. The banking situation a few years ago, charging dead people, the Murray-Darling fiasco about water allocations, aged care facilities now, uh, the NDIS and so on, the ministers responsible aren't there. It's all been handed down to regulators who act according to the narrow confines of an act that they operate under. And I'd love to see ministers actually take back responsibility set policies and make decisions. And uh, that's something I insisted in my government. I you know, got rid of a few. Um, and you know, we're, we're actually handing away the reason that we elect political representatives. And you, you all get the chance, we all get the chance to remove them at the next election. So I think that's a huge problem for Australia and, and it's reflected in massive duplication. The greatest saving Australia could make is to stop the duplication and confusion. And I'll finish with this. Um, at one stage, I went up to Roburn, just outside Caratha, basically an Aboriginal town. Uh, and I went and saw uh, there's a lot of issues in Roburn, which you probably all know about. And uh, I went and saw that, went into the hospital just to have a chat to the matron. And she was a, a long serving, tough matron type. And uh, I asked her about the town. She said, The problem with this town, Colin, is there are 59 government services available for 1,800 people. She said, Every day, someone's knocking on a door saying, I'm here to help you. Uh, services where people actually hadn't even been to Roeburn. I mean, just if, if ever the people of Roeburn have got a struggle, it's not made easier by all of those agencies, both Commonwealth State, university-based research groups all over the place. So we need to simplify government a little bit and decide which level of government's got some primacy in which area. And if I could, I will finish with this. Uh, if you look at it, and, and I, I'm a state politician, so I'm probably not objective, but where Australia's got 2 million public servants and that includes the military, 2 million. 78% of them are actually state employed, not Commonwealth. So if something requires people on the ground, nurses, teachers, police, whatever else, it's better to deliver it increasingly at a state level. But Commonwealth's got the money and it's got the brightest people in terms of making policy. Um, but we're not seeing that in Australia. It's a complete, I don't know if you agree, Cam. It's Look, got a lot worse, yeah, you know, in the last I, 10 I, years. I agree. And, um, mm without going into the detail yeah. of that analysis, um, broadly I agree. But I do think there's another element, and that is that at a federal level, uh, the, the federal government, as you said earlier, is constantly getting more and more involved in things that rightly belong uh, constitutionally to the states. Um, but they've also handed a lot of responsibility over to the private sector. Aged care is a classic case, childcare, mm. employment services, etc. And then there are lots of providers and they are contesting with one another. Some of them are not for profit, but a lot of them are for profit. So a big proportion of taxpayers' funds are going into funding, if you like, private sector operators who then have to be managed. There's a whole bureaucracy that manages them. And over time, they lose understanding of how these things operate. They actually manage contracts. They don't know how aged care works. And we saw that writ large during the COVID epidemic. It was clear that the, the Commonwealth Quality and Standards Body knew very little of what was actually happening uh, in the, the aged care sector. So there's a big problem there. And uh, Albanese said at least that he's going to reduce the number of private sector consultants who are operating to the federal government and to restore that role to the public service. I think it's very important. Yeah, and Carmen, I think classic example of that, the NDIS, good scheme yep. in every sense, but 
its problems that it's going through is exactly what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah. Um, yeah. And a great principle, not working. No. <laughs> okay, so a lot of things on the in trade for the Albanese government. Let's just switch back and then I'm going to open up to questions to the issue that's cropped up a couple of times around foreign policy and foreign relations. So, Sue, very quickly, you were making the case that a lot of this had been sort of lost in, in the subtlety, okay? The emphasis had been wrong, you know, sort of picking fights, not having doors open and so on and so forth. Um, even if you smoothed all that away, even you had the most smooth diplomatic approach to people, to, uh, to countries that we've um, got on the wrong side of, as it were, so to be in recent years, is that going to be enough or, or are, the, are the challenges in this part of the world much greater than simply diplomacy? Well, diplomacy is a, is a method of doing things. It's not yeah. necessarily an end in itself. And there, there is a lot that needs doing. Clearly, we've got to do a lot more about our relations in the Pacific. Um, we've, we've acted badly towards them. We don't think we've acted badly. We think when there's a, a crisis, we're the first ones there with aid, and they're very grateful for our aid, and that's been terrific. But when it comes to more subtle interactions with governments and policy making and things that benefit the inhabitants of the island states, we've really been very bad. I mean, I put my career on the line when the government decided to take away Radio Australia from broadcasting in the Pacific. And I wrote and said I thought this was the wrong thing to do. The minister at the time uh, wrapped me over the knuckles and said it wasn't my job to write those sort of letters. Um, the, I didn't understand the ins and outs of the issue and uh, and so on. So, but I, you know, I, I, I did. And uh, that was clearly the wrong decision. A wonderful uh, source of soft diplomacy, of soft power of ways of communicating with people in the islands and and like in our own elections here actually relating to what they want you to relate to what are the things that bother them how can we interact on the basis of what bothers them what's of interest to them rather than what we think needs to be dished out and i think you know there's there's a there's a culture in the pacific which is different from the way we do things very often um, you know, it, it, people forgive each other. There's a crisis, there's a, there's a method of, of um, people making apologies and being forgiven. And they do that because they've got to live on a small island together for the rest of their lives. You can't go on carrying uh, grudges against each other. You, you, you forgive, but you might not forget. I mean, it's still there. But, you know, there's a, there's a way of doing that. There are processes for doing that. And we don't interact with those processes. We don't act according uh, to the, the way the Pacific Islanders work. And I think it'd be much more effective if we did. So what do you think of guest worker programs from the Pacific? I think they're fantastic, yeah. but they're badly administered here in Australia. So that we're not getting the full benefit from them that, that we ought to. They obviously mean a lot in terms of um, income that's being remitted. Yeah. Remittances are important in the Pacific and, and the workers like to do it. They come mm. back year after it's year, okay. but the management of it is appalling. Okay, we'll, we'll come back to that. Look, I'm conscious of time. There's lots of things we could talk about, just four or five people at the front. Let's not do that. Uh, we've got a couple of roving mics. I, I saw your hand earlier. I'm going to get you in straight away. Please make yourself known. There's a couple of people here. And in parallel, I'm going to keep an eye on Rebecca, who is going to be um, letting us know what people um, outside of Perth have got to say. Is the mic ready to go? The lady right in the front with the red shoes. You, you can't see her red shoes. I'm, I can I'm see her with the red shoes. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Nancy, and I actually I work for state government, and... My question is, when politicians make election promises, do they actually consult with the administration side who is delivering those promises? Because I work on a lot of projects where we say, this is an election promise. I'm like, yeah, I know, but the, let's say construction industry is not doing well, uh, lockdowns in China for many reasons, blah, blah, blah. You can't really deliver it. And so this is really my question. Like sometimes I just feel they put too many promises on the table, which are unrealistic. And I just wonder if the people implementing those promises are actually properly consulted. So, so, okay, very quickly, Carmen, on that, yeah? It's an extremely difficult proposition out of proposition because you're not allowed to deal with the public service in a formal way. But bodies such as the Public Policy Institute and others like it can be assistance. I think one of the things that we haven't seen in Australia is the development of very strong policy initiatives that fall outside government that more often than not do support oppositions when they're well done. The parliamentary budget office now in the federal parliament is a, is a breakthrough um, and that happened under Julia Gillard 
I think, on the insistence of the Greens. So at least they can now properly assess the costs of what they're promising in a fairly rigorous way. But as for the more detailed work that you need to do once you're implementing policy, it's, it's well nigh impossible to do that from opposition unless you have specialists in the field, in which case advice from, you know, universities and academics and others would be very helpful, but time is always a constraint there too. So it's, it's going to be messy, that transition from the policy promised in opposition to implementation in government and good public servants will be able to go to their minister and say, minister, can't be done in that way. Let's have another think about this. And one of the things that's happened, I think, in, um, sorry to take time here, but I'm sure Colin agrees, is, is that a lot of public servants are now very timid. Too many heads have been lopped, too many people have been told to shut up so that instead of being able to approach their ministers and their senior bureaucrats with criticism, you know, constructive criticism, they're told just to mind their manners, as Sue was, uh, for instance, as a, as a diplomat. So I think Several that's times. that's a cultural problem. <laughs> okay, so yes. so that, there's plenty behind that, as you can see. Rachel's hand there. Go ahead. And then I've got a, this chap at the end. Yeah. Hi, I'm Rachel. And who's um, it to? Just let us know. Yeah. I feel like maybe after you hear the question, someone can jump in. Um, but I think something that's repeatedly come up in the di discussion tonight is the increased representation in the new parliament in terms of gender, ethnic, cultural, and to an extent age diversity. Of course, I think it's absolutely fantastic to have more bums on seats, but many of these were underdog candidates who had to overcome huge swings in marginal seats. So I guess my question is what changes need to be made and can be made so that diverse candidates are not regarded tokenistically and placed in marginal seats or eternally relegated to the back bench when successfully elected, but instead that they have pathways to senior leadership. And can I just say before we get a response to that, that is a short version of a piece that Rachel put together in an opinion piece in the Sydney Morning Herald. Was it yesterday it came out, yeah? Last week, I think. Last week, sorry, <laughs> I read it only just yesterday. And it's, it's, if I recommend it to you, just go straight and take a look at that, okay? Who wants to respond to that? Please. Um, I think it's something that I touched base on earlier. Um, from the political party perspective, there just needs to be a, comp first of all, discussion and then a little bit of work that they need to do in terms of the way they select the individual candidates, right? Um, when we look at uh, candidates from marginalized backgrounds, such as women, LGBTIQ, um, migrant backgrounds, they usually get put into a marginalized seat, especially when you look at what happened here in a few seats, such as swan as an example um, you really want to make sure that the parties themselves understand that um, women and and those who are from diverse backgrounds can be an asset and they're bringing different range of perspectives and life experience that can actually inform the policies that they're trying to create much much better so there needs to be definitely a shift on their political party levels but also in terms of the society we need to sort of start thinking that um, we're going to just tick a box in terms of diversity and start having broader discussion about what diversity means to us and what it means to, to Australia in general. I mean, I am someone who came here at the age of 18 um, and I identified as an Australian. Um, however, I still get asked, you know, so, so where are you from? You got a little bit of an accent. You're like, I'm from Perth. Um, I've lived here for my whole adult life. So it's really a broader question about um, who we are as a society in Australia and what role do migrants and those from marginalized backgrounds play here? Yeah. So Colin, very quickly on your party, is there a risk it's gonna be behind the curve in terms of tokenization and marginalization? Is, is there a problem there? Uh, well, I think Labor's led the way. Yeah, so can see that, your can see that. Lagging behind. But look, I think it's changed and, and political parties now look for good women candidates. So this election's probably been the watershed in that. Um, but going back to when I first went in Parliament, I tried and I tried as Premier to bring a couple of very outstanding women into safe seats uh, and the like, uh, and I failed. Um, and I was incredibly disappointed about this, and I shouldn't say this, but I will. The biggest problem was other women. Pretty offensive thing to say, but generally I noticed that it was women that opposed women getting into safe seats. Women in the Liberal Party or women yeah. voters? No, in the, in the okay, organisation, on selection yeah. panels and the like. Okay, yeah. I'm going back to the 1990s, yeah, but that's yeah. the reality. Yeah. It was, whether it was a jealousy thing or whatever else, because quite often I had male members on side trying to get more women in sure. just for political you know, okay. results. That's Interesting. Mm -hmm. Gentlemen there, mm -hmm. got a microphone off you go. Right. Um, this question's for the whole panel. Uh, I'm Dr Andrew Broaches. I teach at the University of Western Australia. 
The tertiary sector has lost around $39 billion as a result of COVID. We have lost around 40,000 jobs. We have seen our sector denied JobKeeper about five or six times where the rules were specifically changed to cut the tertiary sector. And we've seen an increasingly casualized workforce in the tertiary sector ripped off to the tune of tens of millions of dollars. Why was none of this an issue, do you think, in this federal election campaign? And how can you change the conversation around tertiary education in this country? Okay, okay. Thank you. Not everyone needs to just quick reactions. Look, Sue, Carmen? It, it, was, it was one of the mysteries to me that it wasn't more, more clearly front and centre. And not just tertiary education. You know, you've outlined a, a range of problems there with which I'm very familiar. But also school education, not taking over schools, but school funding, the inequities in school funding, the failures in, in tertiary education policy. Um, I am hoping that one of the first things you'll see from a Labor government is that they will sit down and dissect those entrails um, more carefully, because I know that it's it's close to the values that, for instance, the minister holds if, if Tanya Plebyshek is the uh, confirmed in the ministry uh, and the government. But uh, as you've said, the, these are some of these are long term problems, particularly the casualization, the decline in research funding, all those things just have to be addressed systematically. And I'm hope that I'm hoping that's what Albanese means when he talks about the need to do some of the further work, that there's a there's a whole agenda of things that weren't captured by this very modest uh, election platform that was laid out. And clearly tertiary education is one. I, I can't speak for the party. I don't know what they're doing, but you know, like you, I hope they get their act together because it's a very serious problem. Okay, just before that, I'm gonna just turn to Rebecca, a couple of questions if you can, representing whoever's out there, yeah? So we have someone online asking, um, can we set up a collaborative, collaborative style parliament that you see in some European countries? Okay, that's it. Okay, all right. Anyone want to react to that? Not yes, you? we can. Is there yeah. political will to do so? That's where I'm not really sure about the answer. I think it would take a very, very long time. I think there needs to be a greater societal pressure um, to make sure that those that we elect are being held accountable. And, and if we want them to shift their behaviours and work in a more sort of collaborative setting, then, then yes, but this is sort of something that could happen maybe couple of decades down the track. So, so I, anyone want to come in on that quickly? I, I, I yeah. think it's difficult given yeah. the way, uh, you know, the Westminster system has constructed the idea of government and opposition. It isn't going to change overnight. I think you can change the temperature in the parliament. You can re you reduce the amount of animosity and biff culture, if you like. Uh, and I think having um, people from a variety of backgrounds and cultures and more women can contribute to that. It won't solve the problem, but it can contribute to that. So people are thinking differently about the culture that they encounter and object to it when they see that it's, you know, too blokey, as uh, one of the, the failed candidates put it uh, 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 following the election. But it won't happen overnight because the rewards are there, including from the media, for people who can deliver a one-two punch. And they think of it in terms of combat. So that, that will be a difficult culture to break apart. It's not impossible, but it's not going to happen overnight, I fear. Yeah. Okay, but I guess it means, you know, sort of, putting political capital in, into the deal, which is that you give your opponents some role in the government, you give some of the committee chair, chairs roles to members of the opposing party, actually giving away power as a prerequisite of cre creating collaboration. It's worked pretty well, actually. You know, that, that, that's where the real discussion goes on. Yeah. The problem is that governments don't listen to the findings of committees. So okay, you know, okay. <laughs> All right, okay. the executive has become much more powerful over the last 30, 40 years in Australian politics, and the parliament and all its elements are less powerful. And I think that's a shift that we're now seeing with a, with a big increase in independence. We may see parliaments have more clearly the role that they're expected to have in a, a democracy. Yeah. Okay. With the change in the, in the composition and more women in Parliament, I think we will see an improvement in question time. And if you watch federal, it's true of state, but watching federal question time, it's an absolute embarrassment, absolutely embarrassing. So that, I think, will change. Yeah. Maria, off you go. Hi. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Uh, my name is Maria Osman. Um, Linda Burney will be the first female Indigenous minister ever, which is fantastic. And there was a big groundswell and support for the Uluru Statement, as been mentioned, number one, second priority. Her responsibility will be to lead the conversation across Australia of constitutional change and a referendum. Um, what do the panel think is the appetite within the Australian community to get that referendum through and any insights into that? 
Okay, briefly, uh, Sue first. Yes, I've, I've worked um, for, for a short time in my career with Aboriginal communities in the, in the Kimberley. Um, and uh, I'm sure that there's an appetite for it. And I also am quite sure that within um, the community in Australia, the, full of the wider community and the Aboriginal community and other, you know, yeah, the, the wide range, there are people who, have got, who are capable of doing it. And there are communities which will support them and, and be behind them. So I'm, I don't think, uh, I think, I think it'll, it'll happen. The difficulty will be getting, getting it uh, in a form, in the wording of which, which is the right sort of wording, so that it, it, it can get through. Whereas the last time it was tried, the, the, the wording was deliberately uh, skewed so that, it, so, that, uh, so that it doesn't get in. I can't remember which, which, uh, which, which can you remember which the one Republic. it was? The public, yes, oh, exactly. absolutely, yes. And geared so that it wouldn't get in. So you've got to have the, the will, the political will, to write it in such a way that it'll get passed. Okay. Martina? I really just hope that the process will be led by First Nations people and that the politicians will actually listen to the recommendations on how that should be implemented, whether it's within domestic or foreign policies, because a lot of times there is, there's listening and then there is the proper listening where you actually take on the feedback. So I really just do hope that it's going to be done the proper way. Colin? Yeah, look, I think it's a great pity that um, uh, formal recognition of Aboriginal people in the constitution didn't happen. Ken Wyatt, I think, should have pushed a bit harder because Australians would have voted for that 90%, uh, no doubt about it. I see a risk, though, the Uluru statement, and, and I'm no expert on it, but my understanding is the concept of a voice to parliament has not been defined or explained, um, and it's hard to get referendums approved in Australia. You know, majority of the states, majority of the people. And the worst thing, I think, would be if something is put up and defeated at a referendum and a voice to parliament could be defeated. Recognition won't be. And I don't know that you need to have that part in the constitution initially. Federal parliament could do that itself, uh, set up some structure, whatever it might be. And then in time, maybe that might get included in the constitution. So that really, you know, I'd hate to see uh, one step forward and three back. And there's a risk of that happening. Common, can well, you I've, avoid that? I've been encouraged by what Linda Burner, Burney has been saying and about the fact that she has a group of other members, Indigenous members in the federal parliament uh, with strong connections throughout Australia and that they will be listening very closely to properly legislate a question that uh, she believes and her group and the consult consultations uh, agree will get the support of the opposition because without that, it won't happen, I think. That's the history of referenda in Australia. So um, I think they'll move as quickly as they can given the need for those discussions. But there have been, as you know, lots and lots and lots and lots of discussions already. So they can draw on that goodwill that's already out there. And the fact that Albanese put it out as the, the first priority in his uh, victory speech, I think means they're really going to devote a lot of time and energy to this. But they're also acutely aware that they need to bring the opposition along with them. So they won't be doing it in a way that is confrontational. They'll really have to, it'll be the model in a way for other things that might need to get done. You know, if you want to do something that's really difficult in the Australian community, you have to convince more than just, you know, 30% of the population. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Romola. Thank you. My name is Romola. I'm a psychologist. Um, in recent years, our government has modelled a worrying lack of distrust or at least disrespect for the humanities and the sciences and the evidence that they produce. I'd go so far as to say that there has been a cynical disregard for expertise. Do you see a change coming? I'm addressing this to Colin. Do you think that the new government will show a greater respect for evidence and by extension, the institutions and the individuals that generate it? Well, I would hope so. And uh, while I previously said, I think ministers need to be making decisions, not decisions off the top of their head, you know, proper advice, experts, talk to people. Um, I think that's important. Uh, I'd like to think I did that as a Premier. I really made um, rapid decisions. I did on sharks and that backfired <laughs> very badly. Uh, but, I, you know, you've got to, you should use the public service and you should use outside expertise if it's needed and, and do that. And that really, I think that comes down to the heads of department too. I mean, Carmen made the comment about um, a lot of public servants becoming very timid, and I agree with that, they are. Um, and I was very lucky when I first became a minister. Um, there was a group of very senior, very professional public servants, 
And I took a heap of advice from one of them actually trained me how to be a minister in reality because I didn't have much idea. Um, and uh, we've lost that. We've lost a lot of the best people in the public sector who know the level of competency of their agency and can tell you, um, well, yeah, we can handle that, but we need some extra. Yeah. So, yeah, it's good. One yeah. uh, in, in one caretaker period, uh, there was a guy called Des Kelly, so I might remember. He, was, he wasn't the head of the public service, but he was the most respected and senior public servant. And um, I was a minister and we we're going into an election. And he said, oh, well, minister, never called me that. Minister, good luck. I hope you uh, do well. Um, I'm in charge now. And I assure you, nothing will go wrong. But you won't. <laughs> and it didn't. <laughs> a hand right there. Ching right there. My question is very simple. Uh, I'll be very short. Uh, I, I have seen two elections within Australia since I came, ended up in Australia. No party, uh, not even the public, discussed the issue of the things going overseas, especially uh, we create problems within Australia and we look for solutions outside Australia. And also the skill sets, we always look for, for example, the big, uh, big industry like oil and gas and mining. We always look for skill sets outside Australia. Oh, we need people, we need people. But I haven't seen, or maybe the stats itself says that we don't have enough skill set to do the things ourselves. So. Uh, this has never been a discussion in the uh, elections and whatnot. So my question is, uh, do you think like we as a public along with the government should bring up the issue that we should be aligned ourselves uh, doing the things within Australia, building up the skill sets and especially uh, like stop looking for things overseas, especially the manufacturing sector. So we think we need to create jobs, but uh, where the jobs are coming from? on just the digging the earth, that's it. So why this has never been in discussion? Very, very so. good question. Can I get Martina to go first on this? Yeah, absolutely. So are you asking why jobs have not been part of discussion or part of the election platform? Jobs part of discussion, definitely everyone needs mm -hmm. jobs, but how do we create jobs? Hmm. So the Liberal Party ran on a strong sort of drops election election platform, um, and that was sort of part of the discussion. They didn't necessarily outline uh, for that same reason as we sort of just uh, heard earlier that we, we heard some plan that we're going to create more jobs. We didn't necessarily uh, understood how they were going to do it if they were uh, to win. I totally agree that there needs to be a better a either better migration policy for Australia. So if we bring those from overseas in, they have opportunity to stay in the country, uh, such as with regards to the Pacific Islands. Or if we decide to put forward um, election promises based on jobs, we're going to actually make sure that we have the education and we have those who are actually going to be able to teach those skills also available here in the country. Um, so we know that foreign affairs issues never decide an election. Um, it is the domestic issues. Um, that's why um, jobs were part of the, the political platform. However, what was missing was the, the afterthought of how we were actually going to achieve those promises. And again, people probably saw through it and voted for the other side. So, so briefly, um, self-reliance. Does Australia need to be more self-reliant? Behind the question? Um, it, 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 yes and no. I mean, I think we have to, as, as um, we've heard earlier, um, we can't fulfill all the needs from domestically, no matter how, how much we might want to train people up. But there are skills with, and expertise and technical expertise, which we just don't have and which you can't develop short term. And we need to look internationally for, and you have to have a process for doing that. But at the same time, we do need to do something about our TAFE situ uh, situation and about the training of people within industries. Um, before mining used to train most of its people itself and be self-sufficient in now, now it outsources that training. And so uh, something needs to be done in, in all that area. There's no no question. Look, I, I think um, without defending the ALP on this score, they did actually very clearly indicate a desire for increased uh, TAFE funding to uh, skill more Australians. I think that's a, a critical thing. The TAFE has been dismembered over the last 20 years and, and is really not doing the role that it, that it can do for improving the skills of Australians. The other thing that a lot of people perhaps didn't connect in this way was the childcare policy. Reducing the cost of childcare 
means that the participation of skilled women and women of, you know, of all complexions in the workforce can increase. Uh, at the moment, um, Australia sits well down the league table in terms of the participation of women. And one of the things that happened during COVID was that even more women dropped out of the workforce. So there's a, there's a pool of skilled labour there waiting to be, if you like, employed. And there are a whole lot of young people whose skills are probably underdeveloped because of the poverty in our TAFE system over the last period of time. And there's been a laziness on the part of a lot of employers, I hate to say this, who have thought, well, we'll just grab it from somewhere else. And that includes state governments. Why should we be taking nurses and doctors from countries that need them more than we do, who spend a lot of money training them, whether they're from Southeast Asia or the Philippines or Africa, these are people with desperate health problems, and we're saying we'll get more of our staff from there. That just shows poor planning to me. We all those people should be available to us in Australia. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. time is slipping away. There's just one hand somewhere in the middle. Like, oh, go ahead. Go. Hi, um, my name is uh, Dave Dave Pereira. I'm also a student from UWA, but I'm also I also work at a fuel station. And one thing I always hear is the the people are complaining about the cost of living. And also uh, some people are experiencing homelessness as well, and they can't seem to find a house. Do you reckon the next three years the government will really focus on social programs and helping the people who are struggling? Okay, so who want one minute answers. Time is going quickly. Carmen? Look, sadly, they've not indicated a desire you know, to increase the um, unemployment benefits, which would help some people. But in other cases, they are offering um, support for as I mentioned, through childcare to assist people on low incomes to get into work. So there are a range of measures, none of which I think will make a big difference. The housing policy of both parties was truly risible. They have no effect at all, as far as I can tell. And really the state governments need to uh, get their act together when it comes to the provision of housing. Um, and the federal government needs to back out, I think, of that space. Okay, so look, I mean, okay, there's one hand here. Very last one, go. Sorry, thank you. This is a question really from Martina, but I'd like an input from all the panel if it's possible and we've got time. Um, I've been a parliamentary journalist in the UK and a bit of a media watcher. Do you think that the attraction of strongman politics is finally on the wane? So we're definitely seeing, especially with the rise of independence at the moment, um, we definitely see a rise of a different type of leadership and different type of representation in politics. Um, um, at the start of uh, the campaign school, the program which we run, we usually ask women, what are some of the leadership attributes that you attribute towards politicians? And a lot of the times uh, they go with, oh, they have to be strong in their, their presence. They have to be persuasive. They have to have a lot of experience and then uh, we look at the same answers after the course and they actually realize that you don't have to have all of those sort of usually male attributes in order to be a leader so the women themselves are realizing that um, i think the society is realizing that you can have a range of skills and be a fantastic leader that diplomacy is a hugely um, um, important skill to have uh, if you want to be a great politician um, and that you don't have to just have a great lobbying and public relations skills and know how to sell yourself and be assured of yourself, which is usually associated with the male leadership. But also one thing that really does need to happen, and you mentioned that you worked in media, there needs to be sort of a, a look at how we treat women and women leaders, not just in politics, but across all walks of lives in the media space and how are we going to create a safer space for men and women in the media and on social media as well to really ensure that we can create this new wave and support this new wave of leadership in politics. Thank you. Um, so look, um, I'm going to give each panel member exactly a minute. I've got my watch out and I will sort of rip their microphones <laughs> away from them um, because they're not that disciplined. Um, and it's entirely my fault. But the question I've got in mind, I'm just trying to summarise a lot of the discussion we've had. So you're Mr Albanese. Um, you've got the first 100 days, to use that sort of hackneyed expression, takes us to the end of August. Um, what what one, one thing could you most advise or most seek from the new Prime Minister in order to best encapsulate some of this spirit of a change. There's a lot of spirit of change in the discussion so far. What would you suggest could be in that space that would define the, the role of the new prime minister early on in his term? Carmen first. 
Well, very quickly, I mean, he mentioned it himself in the front of his victory speech, um, implementing the Uluru Statement, absolutely front and centre, he's made the commitment and it must be done. And then there are a number of areas, childcare, aged care, where there, we have had enormous um, inquiries and investigations and where it's clear what needs to be done. So those things where, especially the aged care, the, the, the treatment of our elderly Australians is uh, truly appalling and really needs to be fixed. So at, at least those three things, I think, would be pretty good for the first 100 days. Excellent, thank Not you. Not to fix it, but the legislation. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Sue, so, yeah, clock is ticking. Not just my clock, but his clock. End of August, you've got to get it done by then. What's it going to be to define his, his, his term? I think there's got to be a very clear statement about what are the areas of international interest that the government needs to focus on as a, as a matter of urgency. Uh, some of it's a question of funding. I mean, it's outrageous that the foreign minister asked for funds uh, to run the Pacific programme and the cabinet said no under the previous government. That's outrageous. So to, to, to present a plan for how they're going to actually go about these really important issues which are clamouring for attention Attention now. What's the what's the way forward? What's got to come first? What they're going to do next? And I think you could do that in the, in the short term. Okay, Colin. Cool. Question to you, but bearing in mind that that would be something that also would benefit Australian politics, not just the Labour government. What would be this 100 days uh, platform for you? Well, as I think a few of us have remarked, that the policy agenda through the election was weak, uh, no matter who won. So I, I think in that first 100 days. Um, in there might be half a dozen key areas. Uluru statement is, is obviously one of them. Come out and just articulate what the objective of the government is. Don't get caught up in the detail. Say our objective in health is to do this, or our objective in foreign policy is this, and articulate it and make sure people understand. And that gives a signal to the bureaucracy. Um, it's amazing. Ronald Reagan, whether you think he was a great president or not, one of the characteristics of Ronald Reagan was he never gave gave instructions. He would go out and make a speech about the ambition of America in an area. And it would happen, magic. People would go away and make it happen. And it's, it sounds silly, but it's true. I did that a few times because some American friends of mine told me, do a Reagan, try and follow it. And I did, and it worked <laughs> on a few things. Uh, and just to articulate, because you know, the policy development, I don't think was, was all that strong in Labor, but Albanese's now got that opportunity just to lay down what the objective of, his, of the government, not his government, stop using those terms, but what the objective of the Australian government is going to be over this term um, and do it properly, uh, then you'll find it'll, it'll flow. Martina, what mm. would that be mm. for you? Um, from a policy perspective, it would be the access to universal childcare, which is going, which would be a game changer for families here in Australia, and also for the economy. We know that the money we put into childcare comes back almost twice as much at the end of the day. So any money that we put into the children and to the families is going to come back to us. But I also feel like during the first hundred days, he really needs to start defining his values and really needs to set himself up properly in terms of the foundations of the next th three plus years, right? We really need to understand what this government is going to stand for and against. And we really need to have a better sense of understanding of how they're gonna deliver what they're gonna deliver. So I would like to see the foundations of uh, everything else that is going to do on a policy level later down the track. Great, thank you very much. So look, time has gone by. I'm, I'm on borrowed time. I've gone past the lot, lot, lot. Um, I just want to do a couple of things. First of all, um, on your behalf, first of all, thank our panellists who've been uh, stimulating this evening. So thank you very much. On, on behalf of me, to thank my team, Rebecca in that corner and Chris in that corner over there. Thank you very much, the two of you. Um, we can have lots of rounds of applause, but also we've got um, a group of interns who have been working very diligently uh, with the Institute. We've got Chris, Brianna, Gemma and Ching Wei. They're all around the room. Thank you very much, guys. So, so the Institute's been talked about a couple of times. I'll, I'll borrow a bit of time and, and sort of um, puff our feathers out for a second, um, give, it, give an advert, a pitch. So if, if we do lots of things, people have talked about it. Let me not, let me not rehearse that. But on the... Um, on the 8th of June, we've got uh, our next event in our diary, which is one of these Breakfast by the Bay events. It takes place at 7 a.m. at the University Club at, uh, at UWA. And it's dealing with diversifying WA's economy through sustainable new markets. So you're very welcome to register for that. It's a crack of dawn event. And a bit later on, um, at the end of the summer, 
so at the end of the winter, you know where I've come from, um, 31st of August, uh, we have another event, Breakfast by the Bay, again, seven o'clock in the morning, dealing with some of these issues. And the title very provocatively is, um, if voting wasn't compulsory, would you? Uh, so please come along if that interests you at the end of August. Um, it's been my pleasure hosting this evening. It's really nice that people have come along uh, and, and shared some of the discussion, some of the ideas. Please come back soon. Have a safe journey. And thank you for those who've tuned in online. Thank you very much.